watching, swipe right or left or share. Get your friends on and let them know that they can be motivated to change. It's not too late for God to fix every issue. Also, remember every day, Monday through Friday, between 9 and 9.30, we do a morning motivation on Periscope and Facebook where we help entrepreneurs increase. This is the year. I've been waking up every day. You remember this old thing, this is the, this is the day that the Lord has made. Y'all remember that? I will re what, rejoice. Y'all remember that? I will rejoice in what? Be glad in it. Well, I've been getting up saying this is the day the Lord has made. I will produce and increase in it. How many will write that down? Make that your proclamation every morning. This is the day the Lord has made. I will produce and increase in it today. Because God is not about you just coming to an altar and stagnating in your life. He's about you increasing in your marriage, in your health, in your finances. I believe that prosperity is complete balance of every area of your life. That when we talk about prosperity, we're not talking about just your wallet. We are talking about your wallet, but not just your wallet. We're talking about your mind. I want my mind to prosper. How many of you got memories you need to dig up and forget right now? We're going to talk about that tonight. Your mind is your asset or a liability to you. Well, people say, well, you know, I got past. I've been in war. I've been through trauma. I've been through pain, and I can't seem to shake it. Yes, you can. The devil is a lie. I don't care what they tell you and, and uh, the, a psychiatrist tells you. These, the, no, you, you got the Bible says you can renew your mind in the presence of God. Look at somebody and say, you can change your mind right now. Tell somebody all around you, say, you can renew your mind. You can fix your thought life right now. You don't have to be in prison to a mental past. Amen? Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. To Philippians chapter 3. If you haven't got this book, you need to get it in your library. 52 weeks of favor. It's a whole year of devotion. One, one, one devotion a week, 52 weeks. You don't have to do a chapter a day. Do a chapter a week. Devour it. Uh, I read it all the time. I take it with me when I travel. I wrote it, and I love it. Isn't that crazy? I, lo I love the book I wrote. This in the Bible. And I was like, I get, I get up and read things, and here I got, I wrote a whole chapter on 25 things I've learned so far in life. <laughs> 25 things I've learned in life. And uh, I just wrote them down. They're just, and it's just real, you know, the difference between a burden and a blessing's possession. I learned that in life. The clearer the instruction, the less confusion people have. These are things. So you want to get this book. If you're watching online, you can get it. You can go and grab it. If you want it, if you're becoming a $65 partner, and some of you are, and I'm thanking you, uh, you'll get this book. And anything we do, you won't have to pay for. Uh, we'll send it to you as we're partnering with you to get information to help you succeed. Amen? Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, I believe we left off is that where we left off what we're talking about Sunday we're going to talk about today how to get unstuck look at somebody say got to get unstuck <clears throat> somebody <laughs> this is funny but <clears throat> guy goes and buys 10 lottery tickets he goes and buys 10 lottery tickets 10 of them and he comes out and he says I have 10 chances to win this $200 million. 10 chances. And the guy says to him, oh, so did you, you know, you got, what, 10, 10 numbers? He said, no, I did the same number. I just bought 10 tickets. And the person says, no, it, you only have one chance to win the lottery. He said, no, no, I bought 10 tickets. It's the same number, but I got 10 tickets. That means I got 10 chances. He said, no, you got one chance. You wasted the rest. And the guy was completely angry about it and said, no, I, just because I got the same number don't mean I have 10 chances. And the problem is, is you're laughing at that, but that's how many of you try to live life. You keep doing the same thing thinking it's going to bring you a different chance. 
And look at your neighbor and say, stop doing the same thing, expecting different results. That's what's wrong with the church. That's what's wrong with people. That's what's wrong with the millennials right now. We are living in a repetitive mindset, and we think just because we, and this is what they said, the gym right now is packed. Every, you know what everybody's doing right now in January? They run into the gym. They, they're paying their $30 a month, and it's packed. You can't hardly get in. But that's okay because by March, it'll be empty. By March, it'll be empty because that's what we do. We, we have the desire. And, and they say that, you know, everybody's, you know, people quit smoking first, first day of January, and by the fifth day of January, they're picking it back up. Because, and here's what I'm trying to get to. It's not negative what I'm saying. It's that everybody wants to change. Everybody wants to change. I don't believe that anybody doesn't want to have a better marriage. I don't believe anybody that's watching, the thousands that are watching us, I don't believe anybody wants to wake up and have a bad day. How many of you get up, pray at the night before and say, man, I pray that I have a bad day tomorrow. I hope I have a bad day. No, we, we in, 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 intended to do good all our lives. We don't want to be failures. Who wants to be a failure? I didn't, kids don't go to school and decide to become addicted to drugs. Nobody has been built by God to want to be bad. Things happen, and then we get stuck in a mindset, and we can't break it out because we get stuck into an imprinting or a culture or a feeling. And I'll tell you, one of the worst cultures that's non-changing is religion. I want you to write it down. The dangerous place to get stuck in is religion. Religion, now, now Pastor, was it better for you up here they didn't run the heat? Because I see people shivering. I just want to make it. We, we got, pray that we get up out of this building. There is, this, we get in the new building, we're going to be m way more comfortable. Because there's no air condition, there's no heat in the hallways. And if we turn the heat on in here, it's either completely 100 degrees. We either in Jamaica or Antarctica. <laughs> we need a little bit of Alabama, you know, a little bit of Florida, you know. And nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to divorce on their life. Nobody wants to be addicted. Nobody wants to go through bankruptcy. But if you get stuck in a cultural circle and all you're doing is like that guy, well, I bought 10 tickets, shouldn't I have 10 chances? Not if it's the same thing. You can't do the same thing and date the same kind of people and hang with the same friends. I was talking to a counselor the other day, and they were telling me that a person, and, and then this is not a license to do this, but this, was an, this is what they're saying. They said a person that goes out and drinks by himself and does drugs by himself eventually overcomes it quicker than if he goes and drinks and does drugs with friends. And they said being by themselves, they can overcome it faster than staying with the same friends because friends, wrong friends solidify wrong living. Because now you've got somebody encouraging you to stay in a failure situation. And so, no, so you can't keep the same friends and expect different results. So go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. And this is very important. I press on. You need to circle this. Because this press on means that I continually, physically keep pushing. I don't quit. I don't give up. I don't care if you, if you failed today. You get up and try again tomorrow. And look up here. You keep trying and trying and trying to change because guess what? One day you will change. He said, I'm press on. I keep, I continuously, physically push that I may lay hold of that which the anointing of Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended it, but one thing I do, and here is the key to a different life, right here. Here is a key. Forgetting, somebody shout forgetting. Forgetting those things which are behind. I forget. Now, in this word, in the Greek here, forgetting, I want you to write this down. It's got four Greek meanings. It means, number one, it means to loose out of your mind. It means get it out of your mind. This one thing I do, I loose this thought of my past, I release it. Number two, 
it means to take the it, it means to start neglecting negative thoughts. So when the Bible says this one thing I do forgetting, he says what I've decided to do was neglect every negative thought that comes to my mind. I'm neglecting them. What that means is I'm not going to give them attention. I'm not going to let them affect me. I'm going to decide to retrain my mind to think elsewhere. And of course it means forget to forget. I like this last one. It means to choose to become unaware of your past failures. I choose. Paul said, I choose to become unaware of them. I don't even, I don't even want to bring them up. I'm, I'm unaware of them. They're done. I forget. Now, I read a quote the other day, and I liked it. It says, you can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. Write it down. It's a good one. You can't start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. You can't do next if you keep wanting to talk about what was. And what I decide now is deciding what happens next. And so Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind and I reach. So I must, I said this again, and I'm going to I said it, son, I'm going to say it again. Number one, you have to release before you can receive. It is the law of reciprocity that brings the greatest increase to your life. You have to learn to release something before you can receive something. God tied that to your life, that if I release my past, I can receive my future. If I release my seed, I can receive my harvest. Many of you are trying to reach for a harvest still holding on to your seed. Anything you're holding on to robs you from receiving something else. And I have to learn this. It's a mental process. And what I have found out being this, this is the month of new beginnings, January, is everything's about beginning new, getting, getting started. And I'm, I'm, I see that a lot of people have the desire to increase, the desire for better, but they're stuck. They're stuck in a relationship. They're stuck in a wrong place, stuck in a job. 85% of the people that get up every day in this country go to a job they hate. Can you imagine that? To wake up and be imprisoned to a budget that you have to go and work in a place that don't even celebrate you. Just because you got stuck to bills. They say that our country is uh, depression and hopelessness is the number one thing right now in counseling. People are depressed. People are hopeless. And what's sad is a lot of that is, is church-going people. So we got people going to church but leaving hopeless and still depressed because we're not plugging them into the power source of change. They're stuck. Look at somebody and say, are you stuck? This guy named Eric was a pastor of a church, and he decided, he said, you know, I, I'm going to go learn how to play the piano. He told his wife, so I'm going to go learn how to play the piano. It would be easy if I could learn how to play an instrument so when the musicians find, can't show up, I go up there and do my do thing and make it much easier in my ministry. So he goes and he hires a, a teacher, an instructor, and she's very serious, and, he go, and he's not gifted. He's not gifted, so he's going to be a trained piano. It's not a gifted piano, right? And so... He goes, in five years, he's in school, five years he's learning. And, 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 I mean, it's just a struggle to just get, just to play songs and, and go through in keys. And so one day the teacher says, listen, you need to join. I want you to sign up for this contest. He says, oh, no, 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 I, I just want to play in church. I, I'm not. She said, no, I want you to sign up for this contest. And so he says, okay, you're the instructor. And she had him sign up because she says, people get better under pressure when they know watch this when they know now their production's going to be judged there's going to be judges there and when people become aware that something's judging them they get more studious in practice 
Now, we've forgotten that somebody's watching us every day. And if we would just get back to one understanding that nothing you say or do is hidden from God. And that one pressure ought to have you produce better right now. So he goes through it, and, and then he enters the contest, and he gets up there, and he's been practicing, and he sits down, and he gets ready, and he, they're all watching him, and the audience is watching him, and he starts playing it, and he's like flawless through the whole introduction. I mean, he's thinking, and his mind's thinking, man, that practice plays, it's paid off. I, I, I'm, I'm awesome. And he's going through the whole introduction, and all of a sudden he gets through the introduction and can't remember the next key. And he freezes. And he thinks he knows the one, and he hits it, and it's the most sourest note, and the whole place snickers. And then he tries to hit the next chord, and it's even worse. And he just sits there a minute, and everybody's looking, and the judges are irritated. And finally, he looks at the judges, and he says, Look, I can't remember the rest of the song. You want me just to get up and quit? And they were about to say, Just quit. Go ahead. We let you right. But the instructor came out of hiding, and she walked up behind him, and she whispered in his ear, and she turned around and walked off, and what she said to him was, don't quit, you can start over. And it never dawned on him he could start again. So he's trying to figure out where he is when, he, when all he needed to do was re trace himself to get where he was again and so he started over and he went through the whole piece without a mistake and the judges were excited and they had a standing ovation and he walked off and he learned that you don't have to stay stuck you can start again and that's what I'm talking about tonight you don't have to stay stuck you can start again how many want to start again how many want how many feel like you've been stuck in certain areas and you want to start again that's the mercy of God. You know what she did? She became the language of, of grace. She was the language of God's mercy. Because that's what God is. I see God walking behind people and saying, I know that you're being judged. And I know they're sneering at you. And he'll whisper in your ear, it's not over. You're not stuck. You can fix this thing. You can start again. You can succeed. You can go get another job. And something bad can be turned to your good. And this is the year to change your thinking. It's the new year. It's a new you. Amen? And there's four things we're believing God for this year. Divine purpose. Write them down. Make them redundant. We're going to talk about them all the time. Divine planting. If you can't be planted, we're going to come back and talk about it Sunday. Divine power and divine prosperity. How many want these fours to move in your life? Say amen. So I want to tell you things that keep you stuck. Four things that keep you stuck. Number one, I, I've, I've monitored this through seasons. Four things that keep you stuck. Number one, a wrong view of God. I think the number one reason people stay broke, stay, stay unforgiven, stay bitter, is that they've been given a wrong view perspective of what God is the wrong view of God you have a wrong view of God people have this view of God as like in our own periscope uh, I see people all the time come on there and when they found out I'm a preacher they say if God is so loving why does he kill people if God is so loving why is there hunger if God is so loving why is there abortion and they have this wrong view of God God didn't kill anybody God hasn't starved anybody there's enough food. If everybody did what they were supposed to do, everybody would have food. The reason that there's abortion is because somebody kills a baby, not God. The reason there's hunger is because there's corruption and there's wickedness. And the decision of men and nations have created this whole, of this, of, of this crisis. Not God. God gave everybody the right to choose. He does not force you to choose right. Write it down. I have the right to choose, but God doesn't force me to choose right. So that I can choose wrong, and God says, I will give you the blessing in the right, or you'll reap the consequence with the wrong. Had nothing to do with God. It had to do with the consequence of decision. 
and the wrong view of God is keeping people stuck. One view people have of God, they think he's mad. I'm sick of hearing that God's mad. God's not mad. Look at somebody say, God's not mad. People say, God's mad. Uh, uh, you know, God's going to punish you. God don't punish people. I'm going to tell you something, and it's going to go against your religious grain, but God hasn't judged the earth since Jesus came out of the tomb. There is no wrath of God happening right now. I don't care what preacher tells you, God's wrath is coming. God's wrath has been held for a time of judgment. You've been living in the dispensation of his grace. But don't think that if you don't have the blood of Jesus Christ, that everything you've done in that dispensation is being recorded and can be erased by the blood of Jesus Christ. How many would like God to, or Jesus to erase some things right now and we don't bring them up when we get there? The Bible said every secret, every thought will be shouted from a housetop. There's some things you've been thinking we don't want to hear. Look at your neighbor and say, uh-huh, that's the truth there. There's this bad image of God, this bad view. God is mad. God is angry. There's a great scripture in the Bible. It's, it's probably the theme of the Word of God. It's Numbers 23, 19. You should always embrace it. God is not a man. God is not human. God doesn't get mad. God doesn't. The, we use words like anger in the Bible, or they, the writers used words like the anger of God, the wrath of God. But those are all human responses. God is not a man. There's a ways for you to understand something. They're called anthropomorphisms. They're human attributes so your mind can comprehend a, a awesome God. Because there's no way you can understand God unless we attach some things that your mind can see and embrace. And so we take these views and we reduce God down to a man. If God got mad, then that's an emotion. He doesn't have emotions. He doesn't have feelings. God doesn't wake up one day feeling like blessing you. Aren't you glad he ain't like you? Oh, somebody say, oh, Lord. Aren't you glad God ain't hormonal? He don't need a patch, a shot. God didn't, you know, Jesus didn't go, God did you take your shot? You're seeming a little hormonal right now. Half the earth's going to pay for it. He's about to fry somebody. That's a wrong view of God. That God, it, it, we, we act like that our one little decision, it's, it's like in, that, in the election, we acted like the whole world was going to explode. Like God's in heaven going, oh man, I hope another Democrat don't get in president. It's over. We're all going to hell. God had set up the end from the beginning. You've got to understand that your failure hasn't changed God's plan. Oh, hallelujah. God said to me, he said, you think that the failure of your life has already changed the plan I had for your life? I had already calculated and adjusted in your life the failure, the betrayal, the rejection, the hurt, the religious hurt. I already incorporated it in the whole scheme by the time I got to the end and went to your beginning I already knew your whole entire life every wrong decision every wrong step and set up and still set a plan to bless you and prosper you and all you have to do all you have to do is find God on the journey hallelujah I can be 50 and made decisions up to 50. God knew I was going to make them. Find him at 50. And God could begin to put me in the plan. And knew that's when I'd find him. That once you find God, failure is canceled. We have a bad view of God. Church view of God, religious view of God. You can't even talk about prosperity or money or blessing because we let the denominations dominate our thinking and put us in a box. God's angry. God's mad. God's going to judge you. 
God is not mad at you. Yeah, but you don't know what I did. He already knew you did it. He knew you were going to do it. You, God, you, nothing happens to surprise God. You cannot surprise God. If How can you surprise all-knowing? What part of all-knowing are you missing? I, got, I did something God didn't know about. No, he's all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows it all. He's all-knowing. <laughs> oh, God forgot me. Bad view. No, God don't forget nothing. Somebody said, God forgot my sin. No, he chooses to throw them away. God couldn't forget anything. Why? Because he's all-knowing. So I, asked, I sat down one time and talked to a, uh, my Bible college professor. I said, and, 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 you know, I said, so if God's all-knowing, how does he not know my sin once I confess him? He said, it's not that he don't know him. He chooses not to know him. I thought, hallelujah. So here's this all-knowing God that when I say I'm sorry, he says, I choose now to take your mistake and forget it. But I don't have to forget it, but I chose to forget it. And you can't forgive somebody who cuts you off on high 40. I don't know how to be a true Christian because I'm not overcoming my anger issues. I was at the drive-in at the bank, okay, and I'm sitting beside the woman, and, and, and the car comes in and goes in this lane, and the car goes in that lane, and they leave, and, two, and I'm sitting there waiting. Finally, I'm, I'm getting, I, I want to get out the car and slap the woman. And I'm thinking, here, I'm supposed to, and I looked at Pastor, I said, it just, there's, no, there's just no hope for me. I'm building hatred up for somebody I don't know right now, that lady right there. And I'm thinking, if you're going to bring the money bag, you got to go in. This is the drive through I started right up four keys to a drive through <laughs> and hand it to her. There's are four keys on how to go through a drive through swiftly. Number one, don't have a lot of money. <laughs> but God ain't like that. Thank God. Thank God. He ain't like Bishop. Or he done wrote four keys on how you can live better. <laughs> People will frustrate you. God does not get frustrated. Frustration is an emotion. You're in trouble if God gets frustrated. Because if, if God even acts like man in frustration... God, here's something somebody said. I heard somebody say, God's very disappointed in you. God doesn't get disappointed. To be disappointed, you'd have to put false expectation on something. All-knowing knows what not to expect you to do. <laughs> Parents are disappointed. Pastors are disappointed. But God, he doesn't go, oh, that guy disappointed me. Samson disappointed me today. Sure didn't think he was going to do that with Delilah, did y'all? Rascal. Throw that plan away. Go get that other one we have. What's that backup? You got plan B down there, Jesus? Bring plan B over here. What's plan B? Samson goes blind. Okay, plan B. Samson's going blind when his hair grows back. Got it. God don't have a plan B. God doesn't get disappointed. To be disappointed in something means he put false expectation on something. That means he doesn't really know the end from the beginning. What we've got to understand is that God is your greatest coach and cheerleader. That's why he sent Jesus. Because he said, if I don't send you, I'm going to kill them all. Because I got the law judging them every day. So I'm going to send you and you're going to pay for the law. So that I can have this one-on-one -on -one relationship with my children. 
And when I enter the room, I don't have to see their mistakes. I choose not to see them and believe in the good in every man until the end. That's how we need to be. We need to be like our Father. We need to start believing in the good in everybody. People stay stuck when they have the wrong view of God. When you have the right view of God, your worship changes. When you have the right view of God, your praise changes. How do you spell praise? P-R-A-I-S-E. When you praise Him, you raise you take the P out, you raise something. Anything you praise, you raise. If you praise your kids, you raise them to another level. If you praise sin, you raise sin. That's why hell don't want you to praise God. Because when you start coming in here with a praising mind, you start raising God above all your crises and situations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't like the, well, we just weren't raised to praise like that. It's, you, you don't, you're not taught to praise. It's not about, well, that's just, you know, we weren't raised to praise. Or that's not my personality. You don't praise in personality. Personality don't praise. We've been wanting to tell you a long time about your personality. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I've been wanting to tell you this for a long time. Your personality sucks. <laughs> Go ahead, look at the person beside you. I just gave you a tip. They're not going to be mad at you. I gave them grace. I've given you grace to correct somebody. Look at somebody and say, we've been, wanting to mean to, we've been meaning to talk to you about your praise. If you act any deader, you, <laughs> if you was any stiffer, we'd think you was Lazarus in five days in the grave. Say, why are you, why are you trying to be so cool? I see people in church trying to be so cool during praise. You ain't picking up no date here. Why are you trying to be cool? You ain't got to be all prissy. Go ahead and let that makeup run. You know you've been wanting to cry. I know you, that's why you need to buy that Maybelline that don't leak. Spend a little more money. That, that mascara will hold out when you swim. Let it go. You know you've been wanting to cry over that guy you're dating or that husband. Let it out. You in the praise house. You can bust your tears in his presence. I know David said, I kill giants on the battlefield, but when I go to the house, my tears are my meat night and day. David said, boy, I know how to cry in his presence. You know what he said? I know how to praise him because when I praise him, I raise him. When you have the right view of God, you praise him right. Man, you want to pray. When we understand the real value and energy of praising the Almighty, we would get a praise session going in here that pastor couldn't shut down. Can you imagine a service where she tries to shut down, but you won't shut up? Because you are not being led no more. You are leading the session of praise because you decided to raise something bigger than cancer or raise something bigger than poverty or raise something bigger than heart problems or diabetes or divorce or anger and all of a sudden pastor shuts the band off but the chattering and the cry and the moan of the people keep raising him because they have a good view of God I mean like to throw your hands up right now and say I just want to praise him and raise him. I've had a wrong view of my father. He ain't angry. He ain't mean. He ain't judging me. He's trying to promote me. I am not going to stay stuck in Jesus' name. Number two. What keeps you stuck? is you think that God is hiding from you. God's hiding from me, y'all. I pray he ain't in. I, I, if, if, if this, this, this cracks me up. I talked to God, but he ain't answered me. Well, what do you want to say? He got, you know, he said, my Lord, I've got 1,189 chapters you could read. I've been talking for a long time. Blow the dust off my conversations. There's, there's two kinds of people in the church. There's those that say God's never talking. And then there's go, those that God never shuts up.
people are stuck when they think God is hiding from me. God's not hiding from you. He doesn't hide. He's everywhere. God is everywhere. God doesn't live in matter. If you were reading your Bible like you should, you would find out that God lives in space. Do you know how big the galaxies are? Do you know how long it takes to get to Mars? It takes like five years. Can you imagine taking a five-year car trip? I would kill you before we got there, trust me. I can't go to Atlanta without killing somebody. I can imagine five years of, of road rage. That'd be Charles Manson. There'd be bud cars everywhere. It took five years. You imagine five years. And if you wanted to go, and, and that's just kind of right here in our solar system, you can't get out of it. You, you, you don't have enough life in you to get through our solar system. And God sits over all of it. Yet he's so vast and big that there's not a human on the earth's lifespan to get to our galaxy, to the next. But he's sensitive enough to enter into your prayer closet and hear your words. And people say, you see, God don't live in, he's not in that speaker, that's matter, he's not in that, he's not in this pulpit. God lives in space. People say, well, I can't see God. Did you, do you, did you look up here? Do you see this pulpit? You see it? You had to look through God to see it. He's in space. That means there's more of God in this room than there is matter. And everything you saw, the wall you saw through God. And if you learn to open your heart, God is sitting right here beside us. He is, he says, I'm an ever-present help in the time of trouble. Hallelujah. When you go to bed, God is in your bedroom. When you go to your car, he's been in the car waiting on you because all the space in your car is God's presence. Hallelujah. When you walk in the mall, every space that's not occupied, God is in that space. This is not the devil's earth. This is God's earth. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. All that space in your kitchen is God in space. And all you have to do is open your mouth and there he is. He is not hiding. He is right here, right now. That's why I said I inhabit the praise. That means I start get. The word inhabit means that he starts bringing in everybody else he likes. He's here. When we, get, when we walk into this empty sanctuary, God is here. When we start to come together and praise him, he starts inviting in the celestial power of the heavens to inhabit this place. For business, divine business. God's not hiding on me. Yeah, but I just don't feel him. You ain't looking for a feeling. You faith this thing. I believe he's here right now. I said, I believe he's here right now. I believe he's going to meet somebody's need right now. Why? Because he's here. He's here. He's here right now. He's in this room right now. He ain't hiding. He's in the coffee shop waiting for you to walk out. He's going to be in the car when you get there. He's going to be at the driveway when you drive up because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. That means you can never leave God. Your past is still in his presence. You're now in his presence. And the future you hadn't even entered into yet is still in his atmosphere. How can you fail? How can you stay stuck? When you got that kind of power working on your behalf, how can you stay the same? How can you stay bitter and angry and mad? The atmosphere is charged with power, waiting for your faith to unlock it. I believe it right now. I believe it right now. I may believe it. He looks I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I feel it. We got to go. Number three. Number three. 
This keeps you stuck. Believe it. You're all alone in your situation. You're all by your little self. Nobody loves me. Well, we've been wanting to tell you that for months. No, just kidding. Nobody cares. Believing you're all alone. And let me tell you something. When you're in a situation, sometimes the last thing you need is someone to come in and talk to you in it. Because you've got all of heaven rallying in your hurt season. Why do you need someone else at your house when God's sitting there waiting to meet that need? He said, I will never leave you, nor shall I ever forsake you. You don't believe that. Because when everybody's kicked you to the curb, the one source that hasn't is the only source that can get you out. God hasn't kicked you to the curb. Not kicked you to the curb. When you're stuck in a cul-de-sac, just turn around and leave the neighborhood. Don't just keep driving circles and say, we lost. You ain't lost. You're in a cul-de-sac. You know how dumb you'd be in my neighborhood if you just keep driving around? I come down there, what's your matter? I can't find my way out. Well, you know what? It's called a cul-de-sac. Just kind of go the way you just came in. <laughs> how about just be smart enough to retrace your steps? Just kind of back up just a little bit. Duh. You're not alone. There's a difference between solitude and isolation. Sometimes God wants to put you in solitude because too many voices have got your attention. So he puts you in a place where others can't find you. That doesn't mean you're all by yourself because God's there trying to talk to you. You're not isolated. You're just in solitude. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. Nobody sees what I'm going through. It, you don't need everybody to see. You just need God to see. Nobody cares. God does. Nobody loves me. God loves you. How, why do I need you to love me if God loves me? Two people ought to always love you everywhere you go. God and you. That's all you need, two people to love you. You love you and God loves you. And everybody else don't have to like you. The Bible said love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love you, you can't love me. And the way some of you treat yourselves, don't even call yourself my friend. Because if you can't take care of you, you definitely ain't going to take care of me. If you don't love you, you ain't loving me. If you don't have, let, let me give you a key uh, that's going to get you unstuck right here. In I, I feel all alone season. Nobody loves me season. Nobody notice me. Nobody promotes me. Proverb 3, 5, 6, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your stupid. Everybody's born ignorance. Everybody's born ignorant. You have to work hard at staying stupid. Lean not into your own understanding. I read that and God said, I'm going to tell you how to work this out for you. I said, how do I work that out for me? He said, you've got to lean on Trust in and have confidence of the Word of God. That's what that meant. David said, you better lean on the Word, you better trust in the Word, and you better have confidence in the Word. It can do what it says. I ain't all alone. Look at somebody say, we aren't alone. Somebody's here. Now, don't say that in a dark room. In the bed before you go to bed, you might be spooked. We're not alone. <laughs> yes, we are. 
who's in the closet? My mother-in-law bought me a house coat for Christmas. I never had a house coat before. I've been house coat deprived, and I got one now. It doesn't stay tied real well. They need to perfect that, buttons up here or something. That tie don't work. But just to make a long story short, I get up and go to the restroom the other night. I hung that sucker in the bathroom <laughs> by the shower. And I walked in the bathroom. There's just enough light from the neighbor's house that I was, and almost wet myself <laughs> before I got in there. <laughs> I literally had to get into reality. I was looking for my 1911. I was fixing to just blow a hole in the, I just froze. And I said, Mary Ann, is that you? And the house coat wouldn't move. It just looked at me. And I said, say something. What are you standing by the shower for? And three angels fell over laughing. They said, it's a house coat, fool. Literally went crazy. Heart started beating. I took that house coat, rolled it up into a ball. Put it over there by the bed. Say, you ain't doing that to me twice. <laughs> See, look, I'm much grayer now, ain't I? <laughs> What's I got to do with my message? I wasn't alone. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's in the bathroom waiting on you. <laughs> so it's a bad gift, Connie. Don't buy me another house coat. <laughs> Number four. This keeps you stuck. This keeps you stuck. That's a good story on that house coat, wasn't it? I could work that up like a Kevin Hart stand-up thing. I might make some movie, make some money. Number four. <laughs> There's some of you just ain't going to laugh. I mean, you just hate life so much, you're going to look at me like you're going to just slap my face off, ain't you? <laughs> Number four. This keeps you stuck, and I'm done. Dwelling. On negative thoughts. Dwelling on the negative will keep you stuck. You're just stuck there. Dwelling on past drama. Dwelling on past pain. I watched a movie last night called Hurt, Lo Hurt, Hurt Locker, I think it was called. It's a military movie guy was doing bombs. And uh, how the Iraq war was affecting his thinking. And then, uh, you know, we go, you know, the hospitals and, and people with trauma because they, they saw things they weren't created to see. Hate, and mean, and murder. Having to decide if do I shoot a kid or not shoot, you know. And while I was watching that, I was thinking, these men come back, these women come back, and they got them on drugs. They could put him in therapy. And while I was sitting there, I started praying. God said, they don't need drugs. They don't need therapy. They need Romans chapter 12. Be not conformed to the dwelling of your past, but be renewed in your mind with the word of God. If you have a mental trauma, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm going to save you $170 an hour of counseling. So $65, I'm going to tell you something right now. <laughs> I just cut it in half. <laughs> Listen to me. Pick up this book and start reading it whether you understand it or not. Because the Bible said to hear the word bring healing to the body. I can heal your mind with 66 books. Just start reading. But I don't understand it. Trust me. When the word starts getting through those toxic memories, it'll renew your mind from yesterday's pain. You'll start dwelling on the word. David said, Them that meditate on thy word day and night shall be planted by the waters of life. And in due season, they shall produce much success. 
How you do that? You take time. Don't take the pill. Take the word. Make it your pill. And God will go into the corridors of your brain. And he'll rewire your heart and your mind for the negative. But dwelling on the negative keeps you there. Now, I'm going to preach this Sunday, but I want to tell you something. The man, the Bible said in Mark 5, the man lived among the tombs. He said he came from the tombs, and he dwelt among the tombs. Remember Mark 5? Mark 5, we're going to talk about it again Sunday. If you look up that word tomb, no man could bind him, no man could tame him, no man could chain him. You're untrainable, unchainable, and unreachable because you're living among the tombs. And that tomb in the Greek, is past memories. He was living and dwelling in his graveyard of memories. Look at somebody say, I gotta erase my past right now. I don't want to be stuck in 2017. I ain't repeating 2016, 2015, 2014, 2013. Oh no, no. Oh no. I am getting unstuck right now. You know why? I can start over. Here's what I say. This is the year of new beginnings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you pray this prayer and say, Lord, I believe this right now. It is the year of new beginnings. For me, it's new beginnings. Hallelujah. I want my divine purpose to show up. I'm going to be divinely planted in the house. I'm going to move in divine power and prosperity. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now do something. Grab hold of your head and say, brain, get in line to the Word of God. Not my memories, but God's Word. Think the way God thinks about me. Not the way others think. Not what the media tells me to think. Not what some college professor told me to say, think. Oh, no, no. I'm going to think the way you told me to think. I renew my mind in your Word. I'm healed. I'm healed. Pain go. Depression, go. Fear, go. Racism, go. In Jesus' name, mind be healed. Hallelujah. Well, how many believe God's heard that prayer? Then give God praise all over the house. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet and hug somebody. If you're sowing the $65 seed, get it in an envelope. Do it this month. I think you ought to sow one every month. See what God does. Make a covenant. Make a covenant. Keith, I put your book in the mail. I should have just given it to you here. You can get one here and, I, and bring the one back when you get it if you want it now. <laughs> hey, man, if you're watching, thanks for being a part of our iChurch. Listen, we're motivating you to win. You are a winner. You are a winner. I want you to know that. And we're very honored that you connect with us through the airways. See you in the morning on Morning Motivation. You want to be there. We're going to talk about how to get past your past and get into your future. You're going to love it. Talk to you later. Love you guys. Take us away, guys.